Chapter 10, we're going to dig deeper into the gas phase of matter. And want to define pressure, as that's important whenever you're considering gases. So pressure has to do with how much force is exerted over a given area. All right? And like I said, with gases, that's an important topic because what do gases tend to do? It just tends to escape, right? And goes away. And so often gases are under, they're under, they're going to be under pressure if you have them contained. And there's actually just pressure we're going to see just from the gases that are floating around in the atmosphere. We're going to learn about that in a little bit. But that's an important topic when we talk about gases. Now, force. Um, is often often has a unit of newtons. So um, for units, forces often in newtons. Areas often in meters squared. And so we've got a, a special unit unit for pressure <coughs> that we're going to learn about, and it's the Pascal. The unit is the Pascal designated by capital P lowercase a. Stands for Pascal, named for the um, Blaise Pascal. He was a mathematician, philosopher, scientist, and he was an outspoken Christian. Um, he actually lists in the book one of Pascal's, the, the author of our chemistry book lists um, Pascal's famous wa wager that has to do with, um, he basically is looking at Christianity from a logical standpoint and says it's the only logical explanation for you know all of the explanations that people have for life and the creation of the universe and existence of the universe and all those things he argues that Christianity is the only logical and reasonable um, way to live but I have a quote I wanted to read to you guys one of my favorite quotes ah, it's on my phone which is being recorded which is recording right now so I'm going to step behind the camera all right so Jerry's going to read this for us you're going to read it yeah all right so here's the here's the Pascal quote and, and so what this has to do with, if you've heard the, if you've heard the idea that we all have a God-shaped hole in us, ever, anybody ever heard that statement? Something to that effect. I always think about the little thing, you know, that the kids play with. I mean, when the kids were little, I, I may have played with that more than they did. The little thing that's got like the star that you got to fit in the slot and the circle, and then you got the square, you know. And, and I'm like, no, you're not doing it right. Let me do it. And so Joshy's been traumatized about that ever since he was little, but... Um, it's that kind of idea, right? There's a there's a hole in all of us. There's a longing. There's a lack. There's a there's a there's a desire there that we try to satisfy through all these other avenues of life. When in reality, the reason the hole's there is because that's where our Creator goes, right? That's um, it was something that we lost in the garden when 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 God created Adam and Eve and the communion that they had with God there. Whenever man fell into sin. Um, and, and spiritual death happened that day that there was a there was a lack and that God's the only one that can fill that lack satisfaction I spent my younger years seeking satisfaction in all kinds of other places and I can assure you there they weren't anywhere you know Solomon um, is a great example of someone that had unlimited resources power money he had all these wives you know he had all these things that people uh, dream about they seek fulfillment and all these other things and Solomon ran after all that and at the end of the day he said vanity of vanities all is vanity right none of it's satisfied and um, it's because the only thing that can fill that hole is God himself so what does it, that quote say what else does this craving and this helplessness proclaim but that there was once in man a true happiness of which all that now remains is the empty print and trace this he tries in vain to fill with everything around him, seeking in things that are not there, the help he cannot find in those that are, though none can help, since this infinite abyss can be filled only with an infinite and immutable object, in other words, by God himself. By God himself, right? So that true happiness, that true satisfaction is only going to be fulfilled in him. So I, I, that's my favorite Pascal quote. Thank you for reading that. Um, but anyway, so in addition to the Pascal, there are a few other units of pressure that we need to be familiar with. One is ATM. That does not stand for automatic teller machine. Is that what that means? I don't even remember anymore. You know, we just say we're going to the ATM. I don't remember what it stands for. Um, but that, what it stands for, what ATM stands for is atmosphere. What 
if it's two ATMs of pressure, then we could say two atmospheres of pressure. And uh, it, what, it, what it means is standard, or, or I'm sorry, stat, standard, it's based on standard atmospheric pressure. So it's based on, based on standard atmospheric pressure and one ATM is the average air pressure at sea level. All right, so we've got another unit of pressure that we're going to use in some of our calculations that has to do with standard atmospheric pressure. Uh, so we'll use that abbreviation for that unit. We've got another one, which is MMHG stands for millimeters of, anybody want to guess with an HG on the end what it stands for? Do I know what the HG, what the atom, what element has an atomic symbol of HG? Mercury. Mercury, yes, millimeters of mercury. And then finally our, finally our last unit named after the inventor of the barometer is, a, is Tor. And you need to know this conversion, one ATM is equal to 760 Tor. All right? So let's talk about a couple of laws. Um, that are going to culminate in one big law that we typically use for when we're dealing with gases. One is uh, called Boyle's law. Boyle was like Pascal. He was actually another outspoken Christian, and the he um, Robert Boyle is is considered by many to be the father of modern chemistry. Um, and so he elaborates some in the book about um, Boyle and his his beliefs and. One of the things that Boyle said was that as he studied nature, it often led him to think about Psalm 104, 24 that says this, How manifold or how many are thy works, O Lord. Um, so he, as he studied nature, like so many of these uh, scientists that, that um, you know, contributed so much meaningful work to these various areas of discipline, um, they saw the Creator in these things, and they, they, they grew in their... Uh, you know, just how amazed they were with what, uh, what God had done as they were studying his creation. Boyle, in his final speech to the Royal Society, I'd come across this and wrote it down. Um, oh, I didn't read all of Psalm 104, 24. It says, How manifold are thy works, O Lord, in wisdom hast thou made them all. And uh, in his final speech to the Royal Society, this is what Boyle urged them to do. He said, Remember to give glory to the one who authored nature. And I thought, man... How many scientists would you hear say that today, you know, in our day and age and in, in this present culture? Um, but he, he recognized that the heavens declare the glory of God and wanted them to give glory back to God as they studied these things. Um, Boyle is, is, uh, is basically credited with this law here, which says that at constant temperature, at a constant temp, pressure and volume... Are inversely proportional. All right. So, by inversely proportional, what do we mean? We mean that as one goes up, the other one goes down, and vice versa. Right. So, if temperature is constant, Boyle's law says that pressure and volume are inversely proportional to one another. So to write that out mathematically, that means that pressure for a given gas, pressure times volume equals a constant. Or said another way, for a given gas at a constant temperature, the pressure times the volume of that gas under one set of conditions will be equal to the pressure times the volume of that gas at another set of conditions. So P1 times V1 equals P2 times V2. And like I said, you can see from this that is, if it equals a constant, right? Let's say, for example, let's say that pressure is 2, um, where volume is 3. Well, this, I don't, this is totally unrealistic, but we'll say, 
Pressure is two ATMs and volume is three liters, something like that, right? If that equals a constant, well, well two times three equals six, right? If this number can't change, then under a different set of conditions, if the volume now is, is two, if the volume goes down, then what happened to pressure? Well, in order for it to still equal six, pressure had to go up, right? So you see that as one goes up, the other one has to go down if they're equal to a constant. So they're inversely proportional to one another. Does that make sense? All right. The reason I'm stressing that is because the other guy that we're going to talk about, Charles, Charles's law, also says concerning gases that at, at a constant, if we make pressure constant, with, with oil, temperature was constant, but at constant pressure, temp and volume are not inversely proportional, but are directly proportional. And so what that means is as one goes up, the other one goes up. If one goes down, the other one goes down. So his, his law mathematically can be written V over T equals a constant for V1 over T1, the volume and the temperature of a gas in a certain set of conditions is equal to the volume and the temperature, volume over the temperature of that same gas in a second set of conditions. So if V goes up, so does T, and vice versa. One final discussion before we kind of combine these, these two laws together is we need to talk about absolute temperature. And there's a graph in your book on page number 296. Page 296, and it looks something like this. You've got volume over here. And you've got temperature over here in degrees Celsius, right? And what they've done is they've, they've plotted um, some points on the graph for, um, for a couple of different gases, right? And so for one particular gas, you find that at this temperature, this is, this is the volume for it. Let me do this here. So for a particular gas, if it's at this temperature, then that's the volume. If it's at this temperature, that's the volume, and so forth. So you've got these points for that particular gas, and then you have a, let me use a different color here. And then you have a second gas, and maybe it's at, at this temperature, that's what its volume is, and at this temperature, this is its volume, and so forth. Um, so if you do graphs for these different gases like that, taking, taking readings for the volume and the temperature, um, it, it will form these straight lines. And what happens is that um, the, you'll notice there's, there aren't any dots that are right down here at the bottom. Right? It gets close to it, but it's not right down there at the bottom. But you can see for all of these, if you, if you plot the line that's formed by those readings, that they all kind of converge on the same point down here. All right, so they discovered that, and um, if, if I'm at this point here on this graph, what is the volume going to be? If we're down at the very bottom, the volume is going to be zero, right? Well, tell me this. Can a gas actually have a volume of zero? What do you think? No. Because a gas is what we define as matter. And you guys remember, there were two things that we said were necessary for something to be defined as matter. Does anybody remember what those two things were? It has, mass it has mass and it takes up space, right? Well, if something takes up space, it can't have zero volume, right? Um, so in order for it to be mass, I'm sorry, in order for it to be matter, it has to take up space, right? So this, is, this, is, this can never actually happen. But we notice that the lines always converged at this temperature right here. So the zero volume was at this point right here. And the, the, if we continued down the Celsius scale to determine what that temperature would be, 
it would be negative 273.15 degrees Celsius. All right? So what they did in, in working with these, these gas laws and these formulas that are derived from these gas laws, notice like, for example, Charles's formula. What do we have on the bottom of that fraction? Temperature. And what happens if temperature is zero? That means that volume is zero. I mean, in this calculation right here. Can I do that calculation if temperature? Right? The universe explodes because we've got a zero on the bottom of the fraction. Not possible, right? We don't know how to do that calculation. So we can't have zero on the bottom of a fraction, right? And so what they said was, we want to use this formula here, but if we do it in degrees Celsius, sometimes you're going to have zero on the bottom and we can't do the calculation, right? So they came up with a new temperature scale called the, the absolute temperature scale or the Kelvin temperature scale, all right? So this point, negative 273, 0.15 degrees Celsius is actually zero. I'm going to put a line through it so we can see that that's a zero and not an O. Zero degrees Kelvin. I'm not writing OK. I'm writing zero K. All right? And so this is what we refer to as the, like I said, the absolute temperature scale. Absolute temp scale or Kelvin temp scale. And as always, when we give you something like this, we have to give, have to teach you how to convert from one unit to the other, right? So if we're going to convert from Celsius to Kelvin, we say that Kelvin, represented by capital K, is equal to degrees Celsius plus, taken from this number over here, 273.15. Right? So that's how we calculate Kelvin. So there's a simple problem in the book on page 296, example 10.1, that says um, we have a temperature of 66 degrees Fahrenheit. What is that in Kelvin? And so basically they gave us 66 degrees Fahrenheit. That's the average temp in London, England in July. And they said, what is that in Kelvin? Well, we don't have a way to convert directly from Fahrenheit to Kelvin, so we have to go to Celsius first, right? So we use our formula for, um, we know that degrees F equals, what is it, nine-fifths or five-ninths? I never can, nine-fifths. Nine-fifths degrees Celsius plus 32, right? And um, So we could then solve for C, and we would say, if we rearrange that equation, we would say that degree C equals um, uh, 5 ninths times degrees F minus 32. So we could plug in 5 ninths, 66 minus 32, and we get, what was it, 19? 19. 19. Yeah, 19 degrees Celsius. Problem asked us for the temperature in Kelvin, so then we just plug that in right here, and we say that... Um, that our new temp, T is equal to um, 19 plus 273.15, and they rounded that to 292. 292, whoops, 292, and we put our unit of Kelvin on there, and we write it like that. So notice, when you use the Kelvin temperature scale, we don't put the degree symbol like we do with Celsius and Fahrenheit, all right? Any questions about how you'd work that problem? Is that straightforward enough? Okay, so we're going to have to do that when we, when we use these gas, these formulas that are related to gases because uh, we don't want to have zero on the bottom of our fractions, right? So for all of these gas formulas, make sure that you use the Kelvin temperature scale, all right? Every, every formula we're going to look at today, if I give you a problem and I give you temperature in degrees Celsius, you need to convert it to Kelvin first, okay? All right, so with all of this information, now we can talk about what we refer to as the, um, as the combined gas law. And the combined gas law basically takes Boyle's law, which, you know, Boyle's law basically boils down to this. <laughs> oh, I kill myself. Um, Boyle's law is P 
P1, V1 equals P2, V2. Charles's law is V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2. So we're going to combine those together. And they came up with this amazing new name for this law, and they called it the combined gas law. That was pretty original, right? I wonder what think, think tank, tank went into that and figured out the name. So the combined gas law says this. Combined gas law. And this is the, this is the one that I want to make sure that you memorize, because if you know this one, you can easily figure out the other ones, right? It's P1 over V1, I'm sorry, P1 times V1 over T1, I'll get it right in a second, equals P2 V2 over T2. So can you see how that's just those combined right there? In fact, if we make, if we make temperature constant, for example, um, Let's say we had a constant temperature of, of 20 degrees. So we, we said we were going to do, I gave you a problem and it was at a constant temperature of 20 degrees. Look at what happens if we've got, but we'll say it's 20 Kelvin. All right. If, if we kept it at 20 on both sides, right, I can simplify this. Whatever I do to one side, as long as whatever I do to one side of the equation, I do it to the other side. So if I say 20, multiply this times 20 and multiply this times 20, our 20s cancel out, and what are we left with? We're left with Boyle's Law, right? So if you make temperature constant, you get Boyle's Law in the combined gas law. If you make pressure constant, then these pressures cancel out, and you're left with Charles's Law. Does that make sense to everybody? You see how that works? Okay. So this, it, just knowing this law will take care of the other two laws, all right? Um, So remember what the V1 and you know versus V2 stands for. This is the um, uh, left side is conditions of a given gas. Uh, well, left side is um, conditions of a given gas um, in one circumstance, while the right side are the conditions, this is what's important, of the same gas. under another set of circumstances. Okay? So just make sure that you recognize that. This is not a formula where you can plug in uh, numbers for two different gases. We're talking about the same gas, just a different set of conditions. Does that make sense? Can I just point out that you wrote surface stance? <laughs> uh, this is why I don't allow you in this class. Um, circumstance. Can I just point out you didn't bring me my food on time? I mean, can I just say that in front of everybody? <laughs> why am I having to eat my chicken nuggets on camera? That's why. All right, so make sure you memorize that one. to always use Kelvin because you can never actually reach zero Kelvin since the gas would have to have a volume of zero at that point so we don't have to worry about dividing by zero. All right questions about any of that? All right let's do example 10.2 on page 298 says um, and I'll tell you what I'm going to do um, I think I want to do the second one 
instead of the first one because the first one's the simpler the first one has a, it, it, it gives you some values under a constant pressure and so um, the pressures just go away and you're just using the formula v1 over t1 equals v2 over t2 um, the second one we got to use all the all the variables in there and so it says a weather balloon is filled with a volume of 45 liters of helium so we've got one volume which is 45 liters at 1.02 atm so we have a pressure of p1 is a pressure of 1.02 atm and it's a temperature t1 equals 22.4 degrees celsius then it says when it reaches an altitude of 3,000 meters, it experiences a pressure of, so there's a new pressure now, different set of conditions, because the altitude changed, there's a new pressure at 0.692 atms, and a temperature, this new temperature, T2, is 4.5 degrees Celsius. And so they say, what is its volume? And that's exactly what I would expect them to ask, because that's the only unknown now in this equation, right? So what's this new volume? What is V2 going to be? All right? So let's see if we can do that problem real quick. First thing you have to do, I just erased it, but I said you got to make sure you use Kelvin in all of these calculations, right? So the first thing we have to do is convert both of these temperatures to Kelvin. So this is going to be 22.4 plus 273.15, right? So that first one there is, did I write that down right? Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I jumped back to the wrong problem. Um, that's going to be 295.6.6K. And then the other one, in, when we add 273.15 to it, it's going to be 277.65. This one here is 277.65. Okay. So make sure you convert to Kelvin first. Yes? Uh, a bit behind, but what's the word after the well, the right R? Like in the definition, yeah, while the right are the... While the right are the conditions. conditions right? Yeah, the conditions of the same gas under another set of circumstances. So yeah, I'm just wanting to make sure that you guys realize that this only applies to the same gas. It's not two different gases we're considering. It's the same gas, just two different sets of conditions. Right, since we're solving, since we're trying to find V2, then what I'm going to do first is I'm just going to rearrange this equation and solve for V2, okay? If I want to get T, V2 on one side all by itself, the simplest way for me to do that is to multiply this side by T2 over P2. Does everybody see how if I do that, my T2s are going to cancel out and my P2s are going to cancel out? All right. So it's fine for me to do that in an algebraic equation as long as I do the same thing on the other side. Right? So I've got to multiply this time side times T2 over P2. So if I rewrite this, what that means is that V2 equals, and I can put them on any, any, in, in any order, T2, P1, V1 over P2, P1. All right, so now it's just a matter of plugging those values in. T2 is 277.65K. P1 is 1.02 ATM. Um, V1 is 45 liters. P2 is 0.692 atms, atmospheres, and T1 is 295.6K. And so we punch all of that in our calculator, and we get a final answer of 62.3 liters. And I knew my unit was liters because... Everything else cancels out here, right? My K's cancel out, my ATM's cancel out, and I'm left with a unit of liter.
Any questions about that problem? Let's talk about ideal gases. Now, when I use the term ideal gases, there's three things that that means. An ideal gas is one in which the molecules or atoms of the gas. Occupy no volume. What did we say a minute ago regarding a gas occupying no, vo no volume? We said that's not possible. Right? So when we talk about I ideal gases, this is a theoretical concept, okay? Um, a little bit more of space here. That looks like two words. So molecules or atoms of the gas occupy no volume. Um, the uh, I'm just going to do double quotes here to signify the same word. The molecules or atoms of the gas are not attracted to each other. And then finally, Collisions that occur between molecules or atoms must be elastic. I.e. No energy loss when they collide. No energy loss when collide. Same must be true when hit container wall. So so with ideal gases, the molecules or atoms of the gas occupy no volume. They're not attracted to one another. They're just freely floating around, not interfering with one another. And if they happen to bump into one another, we have to assume with an ideal gas that there's no energy loss when that happens. So they're just bouncing around at a constant rate. If they hit the side of the container that they're in or they hit one another, nothing's affected by that. Okay. So a lot of assumptions, which, like I said, that make this completely theoretical, because it's not that's not kind of real wor world. It's not going to work out exactly like that. And so your question is then, well, what's the point, right? If this can't really be, then why do we even consider this concept of ideal gases? And that's because that um, under certain conditions, a gas will behave pretty closely to this. All right, and those conditions are this. Gases behave close to ideal. I guess really it would be closely because that that modifies the verb behave, so it's an adverb. They and that doesn't look like closely. I don't know what it kind of looks like donkey for some reason to me. What is it? What? They behave donkey. Donkey. All right. So let's see. Closely. Gases behave. Closely, oh no, wait a minute. Behave close to ideally. They behave, I don't know, closely to ideal. Is that how I would write that? I don't know. This isn't grammar, this is, this chemistry. is chemistry. Right. At a high T and low P. Which means, when we look at our combined gas law, which means high V. High V. All right, 
So they'll behave closely to ideal at high temperatures and low pressures. And so we need to define what that means by high, what is considered to be a high temperature or a low pressure. Well, that's based on standard temperature, temperature, and pressure. Right? We abbreviate that as STP. And for a gas, standard temperature and pressure for a gas is P equals 1 atm and T equals 0 degrees Celsius. So, one more thing to write down with a little star beside it. So, a gas with a temp near or above zero degrees Celsius and a pressure near or below one ATM. So near or above zero degrees Celsius and um, pressure, that's a temp. Temp near or above zero degrees Celsius or pressure near or below one ATM can be assumed to behave ideally. All right, I'll let you write all that down. And like I said, the volume is going to be high in both of those cases. Pressure near below one can be near or below one um, ATM. All right. So given these conditions here, then that will allow us to use another important gas law which is the ideal gas law. All right, so I'm gonna erase these and write that down. Ideal gas law. And the ideal gas law is PV equals NRT, where P is obviously pressure, V is obviously volume, N is the number of moles. So we see the number of moles has an effect on the pressure, the volume, and the temperature. How much of a given gas we have affects the pressure, volume, and temperature. And then uh, T is, of course, the temp. And then finally, R is what we call the ideal. What is that number? Oh, my notes. Here they are. Um, this is the ideal gas constant. And that value is 0 0.0821. It's got some really crazy units. Liters times liters times ATM over moles times Kelvin. All right. Um, this is a weird unit. I mean, a weird number, weird unit on that number, but I want you to memorize it. I want you to know that constant, the ideal gas constant, okay? Memorize. You were about to correct me, weren't you? It's coming, huh? Yeah. <laughs> All right, so that, that formula is important. Know the formula and know the ideal gas constant that you use in that formula. And, uh, and so our last example today for, for this chapter is going to be working a problem with that formula in, okay? So in order to use that formula, it has to be uh, a gas that's behaving ideally. And so in order for that to be, for us to use that, it has to be at a temperature near or above zero degrees Celsius and a pressure near or below 118, okay? High temp, low pressure. And we can use that formula.
So let's try that on page 10.3. And it says a gas occupies 70, 750 milliliters at STP. 750 milliliters, what type of measurement is that? Volume. It's a volume, right? Who said that? Me. Oh, Joshua. Okay. <laughs> He's like, oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, I just felt bad that I didn't recognize my own son's voice, you know? Um, so, volume is, what did it say? 750? 750 milliliters is our volume. And it tells us that we're at. STP, so that so with STP we know what the temperature is also, and we know what the pressure is, right? What's the temperature? Say it louder. Zero degrees Celsius. Zero degrees Celsius. Whew, almost thought it was going to be a only twin. You were one or two. Twin one or two. One. Okay. Twin one day. Um, all right. So zero degrees Celsius. We use these, am I, have I got your names backwards? Okay, you're looking kind of weird. I just remember 20, it's because of the email. There's a one and a two in the email. Um, so zero degrees Celsius is equal to what degree in Kelvin? What would that be? How do we figure it out? We add on 273.15. So in Kelvin, this would be 273.15. Okay, everybody see that? Yep, okay. Um, what is, so that's, S, it's an STP, so what's the pressure at STP? What did we say? One ATM. One ATM, right? All right. So, and we know what R is, so now we've got an equation, PVR equals NRT, and we know four of the variables in that equation, so we can solve for the other one and figure it out, right? Um, so let's solve for N here, since that's what we're trying to calculate. We're going to divide both sides by RT so that RT will cancel out here. So N equals PV over RT, right? And so we plug those in, and we get um, 1 ATM times, oh, one other thing we got to do, because of our unit here. So with your ideal gas law unit, um, like I said, it's a crazy unit. Liters, ATMs, moles, and Kelvin are all in that unit. What that means is that every other number that's in the ideal gas law equation needs to be in those units, right? So we took care of converting our temperature to Kelvin, but we also need to convert our volume to what? No, um, liters. liters, right? So 750 milliliters is the same as 0.75 liters. So that's actually what we have to plug in here, 0.75 liters. Does everybody understand why I'm doing that? Because it's got, it's, it's got to be in these units here, okay? Um, over R, which is 0 0.0821 liters ATM moles a times, and then finally the temperature, which is 273.15, okay, all right? So the number of moles, it's now just a calculator problem, it's 0 0.0334 moles. That's what N is equal to. Questions about that? Good, all right.